please tell Greg your name and sort of what level in school you are or something like that so he has an idea of who you are. We're going to start with Saxon Turno. Hi, I'm Saxon. Um, I, this is my second year and I'm in the directing track. Um, and my question was um, about the shot list because usually shots are very short and to the point, but with a movie like this with such grand shots, what did that look like? Well, I mean, one of the things they had was, I think it was like three or four months even of rehearsals and prep. Like <clears throat> by the time they had the camera and were shooting it for real, <clears throat> the shot list was well known, memorized, and you know, day whatever. Um, oh, if I think quick enough, I can probably find a call sheet and then you can actually see a shot list from a day it's somewhere. Um, it really would be like, you know, farmyard, they go from the cherry orchard to the house. That's all they had to do that one day. But that's in a normal movie, 15 shots or something, but it was one shot. Um, and Sam never even liked anything to be called a shot. It was just a, I can't remember the term he'd, he'd prefer we used, but since the movie is essentially two shots and maybe a sequence or moment, you could call it. We're also told in doing any kind of press, we're never allowed to say how many invisible cuts there were. Um, but what's funny is all you have to really do is find out how many days that were filmed. And <laughs> that's kind of the answer. There was a joke. I think Sam Mendes said something about, um, you know, how did you work around having a couple of those really famous actors like Benedict Cumberbatch in the scene? He said, oh, well, we just had, he had to wait on set for three months till we got to him because anyway, uh, what was the point of that? <laughs> uh, as you, as we go to the next question, I'm going to try to find that, um, that call sheet. Yeah. It, you... Those are great little um, reminders of how it all worked and sure. it would give you a more direct answer to your question. If you're comfortable sending me a call sheet, I would be very interested in seeing it and sharing it with students. Uh, I know I had it somewhere because I sent somebody one. Now, my stuff's too much of a mess. I'll, I'll look a little bit without getting too distracted. Okay, uh, let's see, James Coca. Uh, yeah, I, you pretty much answered a lot of my questions as you were going through and kind of showing us um, the behind the scenes. Um, I'm, this is my second year in college. Um, going on a producing track, I guess. What would you, what's like some good advice for once we graduate college, like what's some good advice for all the filmmakers out there that are trying to get into the scene of like filmmaking? Well, I know that <clears throat> what I went to a really, a small college that doesn't really have industry connections sort of in a Hollywood way. But what we did have is a really strong network of students that would go on and find their way in and pull other students with them. That's really how I did it completely. Um, I worked on a student film for somebody a year ahead of me. She ended up at ILM. She said, just get out here. So <clears throat> in a way, it's still the film business. I don't know how much it's true in other industries. Who you know is not everything, but it's a lot of it. And a lot of like I've been listening to, Roger Deegan says a great podcast. Um, talking to DP, but other people as well. And most of them are like, in a film school, everybody asked me to work on their movies. And then we all got out of film school, you know, some percentage of us got jobs and then took the rest of us in there with them. And we just kept doing what we did in school, but got paid for it. So it's sort of like, um, start doing it now. And if you keep doing it, hopefully you keep doing it all the way into and through your career. And the movies just get bigger and you get paid instead of paying to do it and sort of like start doing the job now that you want later with the people that will likely be the same people whether you're the first to get your break or they are you'll all kind of pull each other in with you um i think that's especially true with well every job but producing i was just thinking about like um the person who pulls it all together and provides the leadership because you know, maybe the DP is great at what he does, but he's just shy and, and doesn't really deal with the crew, but you're the person who gets them the crew that supports him or the actors are kind of a problem. The directors want to deal with it. So you step in and deal with that. It's like the person who keeps 
carrying the circus along towards somewhere. The director may be the one who points with direction, but you're the person who keeps going when he forgets or doesn't care anymore. Gotcha. That's awesome. That's, that's great advice. Thank you. Appreciate it. I just found that call sheet, by the way. Um, I find like movie credits and call sheets are okay. so much of how I learned about it. You know, looking through the movie credits growing up, like what is a hammer hand? What is a greensman? Like I wanted to know about all of it and visual effects starting to have credits. And like, I started to want to know what that is. Somebody told me, uh, I think it was somebody at ILM. I asked them how they got there and they said they ended up watching the credits of the movie. They wrote down some names. They figured out how to call ILM and then they asked for the guy by name who was head of the camera department, got him on the phone and he was surprised to talk to anybody. <laughs> Didn't have any kind of actual job for that person, but he's like, well, why don't you talk to so-and-so? I'll give you his number. And once you've kind of got your, I can use this person's name and here's this phone number. I mean, they probably won't hang up on you. And if they do, they didn't know you anyway. So what have you got to lose? Yeah, that's um, <laughs> So the call sheets are always interesting. It's an industry standard. They, they vary a little bit country to country. Um, they always have the weather. Um, you know, they have the people to call for various things. And of course, the, the shot list you were asking about is right there. It's very short because, of course, each, each event is um, going to take all day. So exterior, meadow, comms, up trench, <clears throat> four pages of dialogue. Um, and if they succeed in doing that, they're going to move on to the exterior second line trench. And that was a day. <clears throat> this is also where I discovered, um, you guys might know about it, but it's called um, Three Words. I think it's an app. What Three Words? Um, it's how you could find these filming locations because GPS wasn't good enough. This was out in Salisbury Plains where the, the UK does their military maneuvers. And so there's very few landmarks. Some of the roads aren't even public roads. So you just, you punch in the words, the three words of the day, and it tells you exactly where to go to get to. It was kind of a little secret of how do you find where they're filming today. So mega slate rust were the three words and you pin, you, you do that like you do a, a geographic sort of coordinate for that. And then yeah. you type it in. Wow. That's it gives cool. you a pin that's more accurate than any GPS coordinate. Like there it says postcode, not a hundred percent. Use what three words that postcode will get you within a couple miles. All right. But anyway, fascinating. Um, yeah. This is awesome. This is so cool. Yeah. I think there's a, I'll just switch to, so all the department pages, mm -hmm. um, and then the advanced schedule, you know, what are they going to be shooting mm -hmm. later? Um, yeah, there's the farmhouse. Yeah. So from here, they went and shot the farmhouse. Here's a list of everybody working on the movie. Wow. The entire shooting crew, the ones who always come first in the credits before visual effects. <laughs> um, who gets picked up from where by who it's all in there. Amazing. They're, they're very confidential while shooting. Sure. And maybe still confidential. I'm not sure, but yeah. It's really the insider's guide to the day of shooting. Yeah, that's amazing to look at. Speaking of Roger Deakins, I have I'm, I, I have a friend who uh, is the Cohen brothers uh, um, first, and she gave me call sheets for Oh Brother. And man, I could geek out on those. I just love reading about <laughs> just looking at that. That's as interesting as the movie to me. Anyway, let's let's go on. Let's go to another question. Um, Brandon Steenhook. Thank you. And Brandon, I'm not sure I'm saying your last name right. No, you actually said it right. So I'm impressed. Uh, yeah, I went to UVU. I'm an alumni. I'm actually living in LA and uh, I'm in the VFX department. So I have uh, some VFX specific questions for you. Cool. Uh, first of all, yeah, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I'm really curious because you said uh, the, the post schedule was only six months. Is that right? Did I hear you I'm right? I'm pretty sure because I know um, shooting started around April, beginning of April. Okay. And I know that we delivered <clears throat> like first week of December or like drop dead delivery first week of December. Damn. Um, it was insane. The studio didn't think it was even possible. 
um, the scene that they thought would would blow the whole thing in terms of schedule was the um, the river <clears throat> going down the river, partly because they thought it was going to be much more of a full digital build, but mm. then when Roger shot it, he shot it sort of low down, and it definitely made things easier, as well as right. the fact that we showed a test early on in the shoot that showed that it was going to look okay, and so everybody calmed down, but that was still um, the one scene that they knew to go to the wire, and it kind of did. The scene that ultimately did go to the wire, um, which I wouldn't have thought that at the beginning, and it's really subtle, but it's the cherry blossoms falling onto the river right at the end. Oh, wow. Uh, that was the very last thing we did, and um, right to the, the bitter end, that particular scene. That makes sense. So yeah, it was a very short schedule. Um, yeah, that's honestly amazing. But I guess you guys probably didn't have any rewriting because you edited the entire movie. So that probably took a lot of time out of it. That's one of the things that, you know, there were so many things that just could not be changed. So right. that when we went to do it, we were doing it for real the first time instead of having to omits, changing takes, all the right. things that kind of knock you back in the yeah. schedule. As well as the fact that we had a... DP and a director who knew what they wanted pretty much from day one all the way through. There was no story changes. There was no new ideas except, you know, oh, we need a tank here. You know, it wasn't yeah. much worse than that. So you don't, you're not going to get that very often. No, <laughs> I have not got that once. That's um, why um, I don't know if you guys have heard, especially in the visual effects community, what's called the War of the World schedule. When Spielberg did War of the Worlds, I don't know how many years ago with Tom Cruise, he did the whole post-production and visual effects in something like six months or eight months or something. And once he did that successfully, everybody else, producers were like, oh, well, if he can do that. Then why are we taking a year and a half? So let's start, you know, post-production schedule suddenly shrank and it was all called the War of the World schedule. But that's when you have a director who knows what he wants every single day and visual effects never wastes any time because he's not about that. That's when those schedules work. You can't apply that schedule to any old visual effects movie and expect it to work. So that's what's caused a lot of problems is when people tried to recreate what certain directors did because of what they're good at. So the War of the World schedule is one of those. Yeah. And did you guys previs the entire thing? Almost no previs. Um, wow. There was previs for the plane. Okay. Just to figure out, okay, coming up over the hill. Yeah. There was. That's the only one I can think of, actually. I mean, they didn't, what they did do, though, is they had the cast and the camera crew out walking through the whole movie before the sets were even built. Because the more you think about, the crazier it gets. They had to know how long every line of dialogue would take, how far they would walk, right. because a trench had to be just long enough to get to the end, take a right, on the right line of dialogue okay now you can dig the trench so you couldn't really even change the script timing or it would mess up the set that you've just constructed so in a way the previs was all those rehearsals yeah yeah do you know how long the rehearsal schedule was because it was that something like three months it wasn't all rehearsal but it was like three months of everybody trying everything building and rehearsing and yeah okay wow Amazing. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you answering those questions. I should mention that um, one of the great things was having young unknown actors who could be available for those three months. Mm, that's and true. That was one of the things that made it work also. And I was so impressed with George Mackay. I was there um, on this, this big walkthrough day. It was the time that they planned out the big run at the end. So all the department heads, Sam came. Unfortunately, it was too windy. So the normal walkthrough where he walks the set and tells everybody his ideas and everything, couldn't do it. We all jammed into a, a little art department trailer, sat around a table with a map, and he started to talk about how many explosions can we have of big ones and how many resets could we have. And that's when the, the Dom, the special effects supervisor, was like, I can do, I think it was four takes because it's like how many explosions I could fit four pits and each one I'll have, you know, I can go out four times in that area and then I'm out of space to do more pits. So, okay, four takes. 
and George was there the entire time as part of those meetings, as part of those planning, as if he was like the head of department for actors. I've never seen an actor in a head of department meeting, a production meeting, but he was there with his backpack on, totally involved, because in a way, he was as important as the camera for every scene, and he had to know everything everybody else did. And even Sam was like, well, what do you think, you know? Um, you know, from there, it's like, oh, yeah, I just ran it. I think I can do it in, you know, four minutes if I'm going normal pace. And so, you know, he was in there like any other department. So if you had a big name actor, even if his spirit was in it, his agent would let him spend three months in prep for a movie. Completely. Wow. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Damien Parente. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, Damien. Hey, I skipped somebody. Uh, Nathan, I think that's you. Let's go with Nathan first. All uh, right. Uh, hello there. So Hi. I have a very more general question. Is there any particular shot or sequence you are most proud of completing? I find it rather uh, educational to see what people are happy with. Yeah, I'm, I mean, for the most part, I'm proud of it as a whole piece because there was nothing that wasn't like perfected. Um, I think the plane scene, the crash, I'm very proud of how it turned out because it, it came together in such a bumpy way, like in so many bits and pieces, it was never a smooth process. And then suddenly it all just started to happen. And I give total credit to our lead compositor, this really talented Italian compositor, Yuri, um, he kind of came, he completed the whole plane crash. And then the guy to his left was compositing the shot before it. And he would keep giving him, here's the pieces you need for your shot, because everything he did in the plane crash shot had to be fed to the shot just before it so that they would match like on a daily basis. So the plane crash, um, I think the explosion, explosion run at the end, um, that's probably just because it's a piece of cinema and the work we did was so good and it was so much brute force effort. And also um, I got to spend a bunch of time out on that field shooting um, explosion elements. We ended up only being able to shoot, I think it was four of the big ones and managed to complete the shot, compositing those in, which almost didn't work because, you know, with the wind drift and everything, it was very difficult to make one that was shot later look like one of the ones that was shot at the same time. So the fact that we pulled that off and we replaced all of the grass so well, and it's such an effective scene, I think probably the plane crash and the, the trench run, I call it. Yeah, it was such a, it's such an iconic scene. I feel like that's gonna be one of those legendary scenes that we always see in highlights for great movies. Over the oh, years. and of course, the trailer, we had to do two trailers. And what do you think the first shot they wanted for the trailer was? The sure. trench run, sure. which uh, we just couldn't believe they were asking for it, but we kind of knew they'd be asking for it because it was the sort of most amount of rotoscoping and pixels. And we sort of had to do a trailer short version and then do the whole thing again a month later to do the movie. Um, the I've never had a movie. Come out so early. Yeah. We had a trailer due. Let's see. First, we had to do a whole bunch of temps of sequences. The next week, a trailer then another temp delivery and then another trailer that sprung on us it really became just like we just didn't go home we just like okay what's the next thing what's the next thing we it was almost stockholm syndrome by the end it's like the movie's done well, well that's not you know, like we just were so in the hamster wheel not in a good way it was just <laughs> anyway yeah um okay nathan thank you uh how about damien now Uh, thank you, Greg, for your time. I appreciate it. Um, my name's Damien. I'm in my uh, second year on the uh, directing track. Uh, you answered my question in um, in your spiel, I, and I appreciate it. It was about rotoscoping. Um, so I was kind of frantically rummaging what question to ask, and uh, my uh, wife, who's here, and she, she and I love... Um, uh, your work on 1917. Uh, great question. What was a tool that you used every day 
that was super important other than a computer? Huh. It's a really good question. And I'm just trying to think it's, it's going to be something you know, like mental, probably. I'm just trying to think of, oh, well, it's sort of an answer. Um, we realized very quickly that, <clears throat> so normally a visual effect shot is like 120 frames or five seconds. And it's like cut to medium shot, put in the, you know, storms lightning effect. Okay. Cut away to the next shot. And so one artist will sit and do that one shot. Well, another artist is doing the shot you cut to, and as long as they talk to each other now and then, it's all fine. But because it's very difficult to break up a movie into multiple people without cutting it into chunks, we made the decision to do 500 frames per shot. And because there would be shots that were 3,000 frames long that were basically just the camera sitting there, um, cutting it into 500 frames was a very painful thing to do because anybody who worked on 500 frames would have to connect to somebody else's 500 frames and there couldn't be a single pop or hair out of place. And especially for things like rotoscope, that's almost literally impossible. There, there's gotta be some other way. So one of the things that we became very good at, my compositing supervisor especially, is a quick little tool that just takes the first and last frame of every shot in the sequence and puts them on top of each other. So you just watch that and see if you're flipping between the two and you don't see anything happen, like uh, you don't see anything, then it's working. Like checking the cuts in the first couple of weeks we weren't and we just realized what a nightmare we were in for because we started to watch the cut and realized that Sam's gonna freak out because you're watching this, this drama of them talking to each other and behind them in the background where we've done something pop pop every 500 frames somebody's perfect roto goes next to somebody else's perfect roto and it's a different perfect so we had to start finding ways to do blends have one person roto multiple shots or hand a script over somebody else and then come up with a way to check him so i guess that's not really the right answer yet because it's still on a computer but the tool was i think thinking about seamless blending as just a religion, as a way of life, because it didn't matter how good any visual effects were. We had a CG rat, we had CG planes, we had CG tanks. Those could have been the best thing anybody's ever seen. But if the shot bumped when it hit 500 frames, none of it mattered. We would have looked like idiots. So kind of switching gears to being all about seamless pixels across invisible cuts as the most important thing forget all the fancy stuff i think that was the the switch in our brains that had to be active every day um, i can only imagine that sounds incredibly complicated and um, incredibly impressive so and um, we had to learn it while doing like our brains just weren't ready as much as people would talk about the one shot thing it was like every day we'd go Oh, that's what one shot means. Okay. Like, well, and I imagine, I imagine that every production has uh, sort of that re religious, you have to figure out a, a way of life to live. It's not just something that works on every other film. No, that's what's amazing about filmmaking in general, visual effects in particular. No, no job is the same as the last one. It'll be different people. Hopefully you get enough of the same people every time. So you start building a little work family, but no challenge will be the same twice. Um, just because it's still, although there's a commercial aspect and everything else, it's always a creative endeavor of some good or bad. It's a creative endeavor and there is no roadmap. And if there is, then you're doing something that may not be as of much value. You know, if it's just like what somebody else did, you may have fun doing it, but it's not going to be, you know, memorable. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate it. And thank you for your time. Sure. Thank you, Damien. Okay. My colleague, Alex Nibley has a question. Alex, you're muted. I just wanted to say before I get to my question, 
if this is inspiring some of you guys, I'm currently hiring some people to do special effects, both audio and video on a, on a short. So check it out on the HR site. And uh, uh, Greg, thank you so much for your time being here. I teach directing and my, and my question, you partially answered it a little bit before, but I'm interested in the communication process in, a, in something this complex where the director has to come up first of all with a clear vision and then that has to get communicated down to a lot of different departments. And then there's got to be communication coming back about what works, what doesn't. Can you talk a little bit about how that process worked? Yeah, it was, um, I mean, the first thing is starting to realize just kind of what a dream team Sam and his producers put together, like not just of the UK, but of the film industry, um, sort of the best HODs available for every department um, and complementing each other as well. Like, it's funny, um, it, it was casting part of it. It's like, find the people that, yeah, they have to have the, the talent, skill and experience, but do they have the right mentality for this unusual new project? Like Lee Smith, the editor, a, a great choice um, for something that no one had done before that makes use of an important part of an editor's brain, people forget about it. It's not just about, you know, cutting pace and everything. It's about a lot of other things and where editors and directors cross over is sort of, he became Sam's partner in the middle of shooting instead of in post. I think the communication, uh, definitely the first AD, Michael Lerman is, was key. It was sort of like, he was the person that had to absorb what Sam was looking for, and then monitor that across each day and in the scheduling as well. Um, challenge him on things where he knew that there was a reality that had to be dealt with and then hide the problems and deal with the problems when he knew that Sam was only going to have it one way. And it was interesting. That's another pitch for the Roger Deakins podcast because I listened to the Michael Lerman's um, piece on it. Um, and... He talks about trying to figure out where should he be at any one time, a first AD, um, because Sam would be in this trailer, sort of off limits. No one goes in except Roger, who never went in anyway, but he was allowed to. Uh, and a couple other key people were allowed to go into that thing and talk to Sam. Um, Roger was over in another tent operating the camera remotely. The actors were on set and the camera guys were on set. So Michael was like, should be on set with the actors, but he should be by the director. So he was just like running back and forth constantly to keep that communication going in such a unique circumstance. Normally, if it weren't one shot and you could hide behind the camera, the director's probably gonna be down on set somewhere, but there's no room for anybody because the camera's looking everywhere. So- Also, they'd rehearsed a lot. So the performances well, were probably yeah. already Set. I was going to get to that. The rehearsal time they had is where everybody got to know each other. And the communication was worked out so well that they could be so comfortable that communication became second nature. Um, but they certainly did a great job, the whole AD crew and the producers of like communicating anything that happened to everybody immediately because the ramifications of something not communicated or, or sort of dealt with would be a huge ripple effect. You know, if one day shooting something was wrong, you go into the next day shooting, there's no way out of it. Like the high wire act of every take locking down, shooting the next locking to it. There was no saving it in the edit. If some department screwed something up, so everybody had to be open, transparent, honest. If there was a screw up that might be me meant, okay, we're going to have to shoot again tomorrow because wardrobe screwed this up or something they just have to own it um so i guess that's sort of the answer is that a lot of these people had worked together before and where they hadn't they had months of working together before the cameras rolled did it take a while to catch sam's vision um for me it, a little bit people had warned me that worked on skyfall it was like he sees everything and, you know, at the end, we were starting to do 
digital set dressing. Like he didn't like some of the fake grass they'd put in near the farmhouse. So I had to redo it. I didn't see that coming, but it was sort of in his head nagging at him from the day he shot to the day he finally brought it up when he just couldn't deal with it anymore. Um, the fact that I had to be looking everywhere in every shot for anything, I'm not used to that, um, that level of perfection and polish. What's really funny about the farmyard set, from the day I walked through it, I kept thinking, there's this prosthetic dead dog lying by the door. I'm like, that looks so fake. I, I even like penciled out a bid for what if we had to fix it? It never came up, but the grass had to be replaced. The birds had to be painted out of the trees. Like we touched everything but the dead dog on the ground. And if you watch the movie, you can see it, but it, it doesn't bother me now because I didn't. I'm sure Sam looks through camera, so I was like, yeah, it's fine. Um, so yeah, communication was probably more important than it already is on any film with this one because there was no get out of jail free card in post if you screwed it up. Well, I guess I was that get out of jail free card for <laughs> the greens department for costumes for but yeah. Well, thank you for sharing uh, your terrific experience. How are you holding up? I know it is uh, past midnight your time. I'm all I'm wired talking about the movie. Okay. We got, <laughs> I'll we go got, longer. We've got a, when you start to get tired, let us know. I think we could go till four in the morning if, uh, if you let us. So I go a bit longer. Yeah. Okay. Saul. Has oh, a by the way, 1917, a huge amount of our crew is in Bangalore. So I would actually between 12 and 1am was usually when I did a lot of the reviews and then I would sleep a bit and then go into the office in Montreal and do the nine to 10 local reviews and kind of repeat. So you're used to this. Mm. Saul, you have a question. Uh, yeah. Hi, Greg. Uh, I'm Saul uh, Castillo. I'm a senior here at UVU going into directing and writing. Um, and I, I just I, I just Googled uh, you on here um, and I did see that you worked on the Lord of the Rings and that you were instrumental in helping create Gollum. So my question is for the Lord of the Rings. What was your thought process on bringing Gollum, a completely digital character, to life? Um, well, that one, I was, uh, well, that's a big one. Well, first of all, when I got down to New Zealand, it was 99. Gollum was one of the few things that was very, they've been going for over a year already and just like pencil sketches and designs. And um, so when I got in, it was really to build the, the muscle systems and the kind of computer graphics um, process for him, including the motion capture process. Um, and you probably know that in the first film, the whole design of Gollum uh, technically and creatively is completely different. Um, it was kind of a one-off design with big bug frog eyes. It's only in about five shots and he's got the kind of thing where he's at the bars and you can see the, his uh, retinas flashing into the camera by the second film because of a story thing. Well, one thing Andy Serkis had shown up cast as the voice and he was meant to sort of stand on set doing the voice off screen, but he's such a theater performer and couldn't help himself. He just jumped on set and started performing physically as well as with the voice. And Peter got totally into it. And then also said, not only is he now gonna do the body motion on set for Gollum, he wrote in a scene where Andy Serkis was gonna be in makeup playing, is it Deagle? Did I get the name? I don't remember, Smeagol or Deagle. Yeah. Before he's, you know, before he finds the ring. And we realized that no one was gonna believe that the design of Gollum came from a guy who looks like Andy Serkis. So over Christmas, um, just as the we were getting into the second film, um, Christian Rivers, the visual effects art director, sat at home doing sketches, trying to take the essence of the Gollum design, bring Andy Circus into it. And so he came back from Christmas with these approved designs, and we had to throw out all the models and restart building Gollum for the second movie. Um, so I guess what was going through my mind is... Um, a lot of uh, pieces. Like I didn't get that involved in the design. There was too many other people dealing with that. I was just trying to figure out what do we use the motion capture for? How pure, how much animation goes into it? Um, how do we do things like animate his loincloth and get his hair, you know, his little bits of hair moving the right way? 
um, it was a lot more about the digital implementation of the designs, the design itself. There was just so many cooks already. Um, just trying to think. Unfortunately, it's in storage, but I have one of the Gollum heads of like the, the, um, what's it, the silicon painted head that was the, the guide for how we built it originally. What I would share is that when we were doing, I believe it's the second one, we were doing subsurface scattering of the skin and it was going to be the first really digital uh, actor in a movie, even a creepy one. But we were right up against a Harry Potter movie where ILM was going to do Dobby appearing for the first time. And we knew because the guy, Ken, who was writing the, the shading for the skin had just been at ILM and the guy he worked kind of for, Christoph Harry, was the guy behind all of the subsurface scatter. And we knew whatever he did was going to look better than whatever we were going to do because he's just awesome. And it's Harry Potter. And we really thought our movie was going to come out and kind of just go, Bleh. and everyone's <laughs> going to go, look at ILM's work on Dobby. That is just groundbreaking. And so when our movie came out, everybody was like, Gollum, everything. We're like, oh, it was like, because back then, Weta, nobody knew about, cared about Lord of the Rings as a flash in the pan on the first one. And we just thought we may have pulled it off for the first one. We're going to try to do a digital human and everybody's going to laugh at it when they see the Harry Potter movie. And then, of course, it didn't work out that way. So it just shows that you really don't know. Like, for example, 1917, I thought it was going to be a, a small period film with an interesting technical gag that Sam was going to do while he wasn't doing a big Bond movie. And it turned out to be a much more big and important movie than that. So I never quite answered, but I talked a lot about Gollum, at least. <laughs> no, yeah, I mean, that. I think that pretty much just answered my question. I mean, I think that that was, uh, I saw that when I was a really young kid and it, I always assumed that that was a real guy. And it, it always just amazed me, you know, looking back on all the hard work and such. And you guys just did a great job. You did a good job at Lord of the Rings. You did a really good job here on 1917. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for answering my question, yeah. Sure. Uh, since you brought it up, I'm just going to throw up a quick, um, I don't know what to call it, not Easter egg, but here is me with the original Gollum design doing what I've done my whole career sitting behind a computer um, uh -huh. this time in New Zealand. So that's the original bug-eyed big jaw Gollum. Oh, that is so cool. And that's probably at the beginning of working on the two towers. I'm trying to look for clues in here. Um, but that is impressive. Awesome. Thank you, Saul. All right, we've got uh, Tyler McKinnon now. Yes, um, I'm Tyler. I am a senior and I'm on the screenwriting track, and I'm also interested in directing. Um, thank you so much for uh, doing this. This is awesome. Uh, my question for you is uh, I wish I could talk about all the projects you're involved in, but um, when you are looking at a project or reading a script or um, preparing for a project, what excites you the most about it or what do you look for in doing that? Um, well, I guess the first thing is I really need to find, I mean, most of the time I'm into it anyway, but if I'm not, I have to find a way to get myself into it because if you don't care about it creatively in some way, it's just too hard. You need to have some motivation to go in every day and keep doing it. Um, <clears throat> there's been on every project I've managed to find that either easily or with some effort. Um, I'm trying to think, I mean, when I can't have that, I at least find it in the people I work with, you know, like enjoying working with them can make up for if there's something about the work that I'm not into. Um, I don't know whether it's luck or I did it to myself or, or what, but of every project I've done, I'm even thinking about ones that weren't that much fun to work on or didn't do well as a movie, or I don't think are that great a movie. I was still into some part of it somehow, whether it's because it was a good story or it was a, about history or um, a lot of it is because we're in movies we get access, we either get paid to study something intently to learn about it, like 
learning how a parachute works, you know, intimately. I did that on the mummy. Um, or you get to go visit something because people will kind of let film people in anywhere. It's like, oh, you work in movies? Come see this, whatever. Like one of the coolest things I got to do was um, I supervised the watcher in the water sequence on the Fellowship of the Ring. And it just so happened that the world expert in giant squids was only a couple miles down the road at the NIWA, I forgot what it stands for in New Zealand, a research center. And he took the world's largest, at that point, largest giant squid ever found out of the freezer, put it out on a table and let us play with it. <laughs> um, it, it was, he had thawed for a little bit. It really stunk. He was like, don't use gloves. Don't get any of this stuff on you because you'll never get the smell off. Um, but this guy, his name was Steve. He was great. He even like, uh, we were looking at it and studying it and trying to be really respectful. And then he stuck his hand in and came up with the, the beak jaw of the squid and was like, ah, pretending to attack us. <laughs> like, um, but that's the kind of a room you get allowed to go into because you work in movies. You get to see everybody else's really cool expertise out there and steal bits of it and then move on and forget about giant squids and get to talk to the guy whose whole career is about that because you need that expertise just briefly to do the thing you're trying to do and be convincing about it. So I guess I look for things like that because any project, whatever story, if you can get to go, um, like for example, I didn't get to do this, but I watched Peter Jackson's little home movie of it because he was doing King Kong. He took a trip to New York and they let him climb up the little hatch on the top of the Empire State Building and look out <laughs> and he videotaped himself doing it. like. I didn't get to do that, but I've done things that were pretty cool that very few people get to do because I'm in the movies. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. How are you holding up? Got room for a couple more questions, maybe? Yeah. Okay. All good. We have more than that, but unfortunately, I don't think we can have it have everyone's questions answered. Uh, Roan, do you want to go ahead? Roan Oberg? Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Greg, for being here and answering all our questions. Um, one thing you said that was really mind blowing to me was talking about the stitch that happened just in the middle of no man's land. It wasn't even like incognito. It's just in plain sight right there. And it, you, you're completely immersed in the movie still. So I wanted to ask you, were there any other stitches in the movie that were like that without, you know, like revealing the count of the invisible cuts? Were there any other really challenging? Yeah. I mean, the there's a couple I'm really am proud of. So there's the, <clears throat> The very first tough one is where I showed you the breakdown where Blake rounds the corner just as they go into um, the frontline trenches and the camera just follows his face like that. That one was, was in the top five, definitely. Um, first, we had to get the camera move to go seamlessly and then we had to have his face from two different takes kind of merge and then even Schofield, you know, his rifle was up here and then it would, you know, do that. And we had to fix that. So one of the things about stitches also is you'd, you do the rough version you're like, okay, that's going to work. And then you refine it more. And it's like, okay, that's pretty good. But every time you'd get closer, you'd see the thing you didn't get yet. Like there was no way to just start to finish, do one of these ones. You had to do the big stuff, then the medium part, then the small stuff, then the real details. Um, one example like that is one of, I think it is the last stitch possibly, or at least the last significant one, which we, I just watched tonight when I joined the film with you guys, when he walks out of the aid station. And actually when I saw it, I, it, it jumped for me, it bugged me. I thought it was better than that, but I think it was the compression that does that. He looks at the camera and two guys walk by with a stretcher. Um, and then he looks to his left to find Blake's brother. That's actually a double stitch. First, the guys on the stretcher goes by and it's a, a take switch there. And you can kind of see his head's going this way and then it looks this way and there's kind of a, a pop as they go by. But then as you're looking right at him, there's another stitch where he's just staring at the camera and it switches takes. Mm. Um, I'm still amazed at there was a, a guy in Bangalore who did this pretty much all himself. Um, like he cut the collar out, put the head in, um, pieces of hair, 
the background is completely made up of patches of flowers from one plate stuck into another plate. If you ever get a chance to look at that shot again, watch when he is looking, sort of looking down, stretchers go by, he looks like that. And then there'll be another stitch that comes right after that where he's just sort of standing there. And that's one of the best invisible stitches, I think, and one where you're just staring at the guy's face. Um, another good one is in the trenches where there's a off, not he's an off, maybe he's a captain or a sergeant or somebody, this sort of big guy, and he's just crying mm -hmm. because he just can't handle the stress. And the camera comes around his back as you first see him, and that's a stitch ar around his back. Um, and it's another one that's seamless. And there's little things like his hat was like that. So we had to fix that and then his ears and then his collar. Um, but just you go by this guy and you're studying him as the camera does its switch out. There's occasionally some easier ones. There's a whip pan by the farmhouse when um, the two guys are um, dragging Blake's body and the camera sort of whips over to find them. That was one of the easy ones. You just take, you know, take the two, streak the blur, there, you, you're stitched. But there was only a handful of those. But there's also only a handful, you know, five probably of those really excruciating actor on screen with another take of the same actor on screen. Um, it's just full of them. And I do think if you get a chance to watch the DVDs extras or whatever they call them now, like the, the Apple TV extras, Roger Deakins, I believe, breaks down every single stitch in the movie um, if you watch it. And I think by just counting those. Originally on the internet, people were saying, you know, calling them out. And some of them were so off. Somebody was like, oh, there's only 10. Or they list ones that weren't stitches at all. And um, finally, I saw one recently where I think they got 99% of them. Mm -hmm. And probably because they were listening to Roger's commentary as well as taking notes. And now you can find them all. But that takes the fun out of it. it yeah. It's a magic show. Yeah, I, I was have a, two friends that I sit down and we just always have the movie on. It's always just like a staple. For <laughs> we hang out. And they, these two friends love to argue about where all the cuts are. And I'm always just still thinking like, can we just watch the movie right now? <laughs> but yeah, there was a concern. Oh, somebody said the worst experience you can have in Hollywood is going to watch 1917 in the arc light and hearing everybody whispering to everybody, that was our just <laughs> like tearing the movie down, like, let me just watch it. And it is amazing that even when I, I worked on it and knew where they all are, the one time I've seen the movie, it was only one time I lost myself in it. I really stopped caring about all that stuff. And that says a lot about a movie if it can do that. His comment about the arc light is in Hollywood. It's a movie theater where I never go to without seeing somebody I know from a movie project. So yeah, exactly. Okay, if you're if you're up for one, uh, let's see. That was Roan, right? Who asked that question? Excellent. Okay, if we got one time for one more. That's going to be Zach Collette. Hey, I'm Zach. I'm a junior uh, in the post production track. Um, I was wondering what your favorite scene or sequence was that you worked on in Lord of the Rings. Um, it's probably going to be in two towers. Um, uh, let me think I should have been ready for that. Um, I guess it, the one I remember the most, cause it was the most Gollum development. It's like where we, the first scene we ever did where we put all the pieces together is the the rabbit scene where he finds rabbits and sam cooks them we worked on those shots probably more time than any other golem shots because they were the first ones we ever did we first used motion capture we first figured out the the skin shaders and the look of it and we just did them over and over and over and then once we got those we just started going faster across all the rest so it's not my favorite scene as like a, a scene in the movie but it's the one I remember the most details of. And I can also say with authority that in all of the, at least the original Lord of the Rings movies, it's the only, there's one shot that I did where he runs in the first time. That's the only one that uses pure motion capture untouched by an animator. It was touched by a motion editor a little bit, 
but there was this huge debate and a bunch of sore feelings between uh, Andy Serkis and animators when he said it was all him, it was all motion capture. There's only one shot in all the movies that is pure motion capture. The rest all had some animator input. All those wounds have healed. Everybody's talked about it and agreed that, you know, they both were being too adamant about their side of it. But yeah, I think uh, the rabbit scene, as far as Gollum, is the most um, memorable in detail because that's the development scene. And I'll, I'll throw something out uh, about scenes of Gollum. There's director's cut, extended edition. You know, Peter joked about doing the bookshelf edition one day. Um, there's at least one Gollum scene that was never in any of them, which I think is kind of sad because it was really nice and we had pretty much finished it, where they're sitting around a campfire together telling stories. It's just like lit by the orange campfire light. And it was just such a nice little moment. I'm really surprised it didn't get thrown in at least in one extended version of, I'm pretty sure it was Two Towers. But... Yeah. Awesome. I'm really amazed. No Harry Potter questions. Usually yeah. there's at least one. That, uh, That's another time. Craig, there's like, we've, there's about as many people with questions as there are who, who, who aren't being asked has got to ask. So like I said, we could stay here a long time. I wish you, they all were, you know, for you guys who didn't have your questions answered, I'm really sorry, but he's, he's given us an hour and a half already. So um, uh, I do want to ask before you leave, uh, it was pointed out by someone in a comment, if you could just tilt your screen a little bit to your left, <laughs> because I just noticed there on the edge of frame, your, uh, your, your book, your book, uh, you know, thrown in there just to hold up some yeah. books. That's it's really called um, a, um, what do you call it? Pandemic vanity bookshelf. I have read all these books and I do care about them, but it's also a convenient place to put a little subtle Easter egg in. Yeah, I know. Um, but I got really embarrassed one day because I was on a call, um, a big client call with like 20 people on Zoom and it had been going on way too long and everybody's just ready to be over. We had finished the call, but then the executive producer on the client side was like, is that an Oscar behind you? Can we see that? <laughs> and unfortunately, one of the other people on the call was sitting behind me at the Oscars and he was nominated and didn't win. Oh. The last thing he needed was to hear about my Oscar on a call that we all wanted to be over. So... <laughs> I'm did, happy did, to did show ever, it now, but it's awkward sometimes. You ever pull it out to settle arguments? <laughs> no, but I, there will come a day for the Woody Allen thing of like, play the trump card or yeah. something. I think uh, I think in the second, what is it, Austin Powers movie? Uh, I don't know if you've seen it with uh, Steven Spielberg says, yes, well, my little friend has can, can argue with that, something like that. I don't know. Anyway, okay. Well, thank you so much for staying up so late with us. We really appreciate it. Um, I've got to give a huge uh, thanks, guys, to my brother who was uh, Greg's roommate in college and uh, and uh, cooked us up. And I guess I, I mean, if I, I don't have a lot of memory, but I of, of it, but I, I hung out there and we got to meet. But uh, but uh, that was uh, years ago, and I don't, you know, particularly remember anything. Are you going to take credit for everything since? What? <laughs> This is that fateful day we met, and they'll look look how it ended up. It was, yep, for yeah, sure, it worked out well. David talks about him, you showing him an animation you done, did of like a bouncing ball. It was one of the first things you ever did, and how excited you were about it. And uh, and so, and yeah. that's probably the best animation I've done. I'm not really an animator. There you go. <laughs> there you go. All, All right, right, we'll do it again when I finished another one. But it'll be a couple of years probably. Well, yeah, that's a great question. Are you are you on your break now? Finally. No, uh, well, I had a pretty long break last year, but I'm now, ironically enough, I'm working on the Amazon Lord of the Rings series. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Well, excellent. It's been a pleasure. And thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks. Thanks, you guys, for watching the movie. And uh, I'd love to make an announcement to everybody. We'll just let Greg go. Um, but uh, if Bye. Wants to stick